uh, comments or general questions uh, before our closing hour of 11, and then our, our speakers will still be here for a few minutes, I think, for any additional uh, thoughts that you might want to uh, provide or any additional discussion. Thank you very much. that you would like to address in general. Okay, let's start with our speakers addressing a question because some of these gentlemen are and, and ladies are meeting each other for the first time, although they're like two blocks from one another in Seattle, so it's important to come to San Francisco. What are some of the pressing issues one of the pressing issues that you would like to put forward or that you would like to have the American Society of Hematology address. We have all this data. Is there anything actionable? Isaac. I'll get started by uh, going down the gauntlet that there's the need for partnership between ASH and the FBI, the Foundation for Women and Girls with Love Authority. Really think about uh, this uh, issue of hydroxyurea and pregnancy uh, because, as you know, the recent guidelines have come out, uh, quoting a low level of evidence uh, with strong recommendations that women with typical disease uh, uh, should be recommended to stop hydroxyurea. I think the caveat needs to be made for uh, mothers who are well controlled, uh, prospective mothers who are well controlled of hydroxyurea. I think that issue needs to be addressed. And so maybe this will be the forum to generate the discussion. Excellent. Does, does anyone else have any comment about that? Okay, we have an actionable item here. Yeah, uh, Dr. Locker. And this may be uh, my willingly uh, transfusion medicine had with this. And I know I did not have time in, in my. Talk to look at uh, approaches with resuscitation, specifically transfusion resuscitation in obstetric women. Uh, the question of um, what is the optimal resuscitation strategy has been a tremendous amount of attention in trauma. Uh, there are um, uh, large uh, prospective observational studies. Proper, uh, proper should be coming out uh, very soon. The results of that randomized way looking at ratios of blood products and trauma. Um, it's frustrating to uh, be asked what, what's an optimal approach to transfusion. So, as Dr. Mann has pointed out, you know, the etiology behind the hemorrhage. So I'll take that on. Specifically, you know, because I work in the disease that affects women with girls with anemia and malaria intervention, as I, as I noted, we have a tremendously effective intervention in the big problem that they're working with. It, unfortunately, in, in the process of the whole outbreak, where individuals are avoiding care, and those providing care are changing the kind of care that they're doing, that they're offering because of potential exposure that is called the purposes of equal in this new situation, means that we've got a lot of programming that is essentially crumbling in the beginning of the year and in the year. And this is, uh, this is going to be a much more widespread
We think that the primary or the widespread explanation is that the fact that so many health care claims do not come from the United States. Mm -hmm. And maternal hemorrhage being a, a great example of this, that we don't have this explanation in the study. So, where, like you said, we get 80% of all maternal infant infections. So, if we ha don't have the basic interventions in place, I'm hopeful that in the long term, this this focus on the well being of all citizens will actually push these interventions to be able to accelerate the speed of treatment. Yeah, and to move forward. Yeah, just I have two questions. One is about the um, effect of the sulfur drug for malaria in patients who are treated for the deficient immune system. I know it's not in this case. Living through a long-term relationship with PrEP, that that could be an additional symptom in you. But if you can. Yeah, we've actually not seen a particular problem with D6 PD deficiency in PrEP and HIV. Um, that may be a dose, but it's a relatively low dose for the very effective parasite, and we don't have a good way of attributing to that. Having said that, the in the malaria community, so this is a dieback that we use, we use adenine chloride. So, mm -hmm. for the treatment of the liver stage, of persistent liver stage of malaria. Now, if someone doesn't have a persistent liver stage, they may have uh, adenine chloride. G6PD deficiency in the use of adenine chloride is a huge problem. And so, right now, there is, is underway. Very interesting phenomena. We've essentially met buyback again. That is, it's very hard to deal with the liver stage. Two week treatment, nobody gets the full treatment. If you don't get the full treatment, you don't hear it the rest of the time. And for people with D6 PD deficiency, you get the liver stage. Um, so we haven't done anything. We're about to potentially have a clinical single dose supportive treatment in people who've been working on rapid diagnostic. Care of the D6PD deficiency. The combination of those two will revolutionize the care of that virus in the long term. So we are at a cusp, and, and we might look for this in the next two to three years. That will probably be the next step. Comment on that because so this is the case where the African variant that we've been monitoring mm -hmm. could move, um, but elsewhere we've got this we've got this diversity that you're describing. And having said that, with this effort to develop point of care testing, there is actually a uh, I think a new impetus to try to address the, the level of severity of the disease the deficiency. So that's not a point of care thing, but it will be potentially paired with this and we'll want to. As I understand it, um, G6 PD deficiency confers no benefit with respect to malaria. Is that correct? I mean, I don't know why it's so common. In, I, 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 okay, so, you, okay. So there, there are yes, it does, and no, it doesn't. But what is? What would you say? So it's not Thank you. 
they're actually just really just consistent overall overall and less than two percent depending on the higher the more severe it is it's usually it's more than one percent but the last one is always one percent so it's there for a reason okay I have to ask just one question of, uh, of the Chief Judge. How do we uh, best take a culturally competent history when we see our individuals with a bleeding disorder, given our own maybe biases in this country of you don't marry your relatives, you, you know, you don't really, that that's not commonly done. But what's the best way to approach this with uh, our patients who are from other countries and we've got to now really think about this as we deal with many different populations in our country. That's a very good point. So, during the history making process, I think as we're going through family history, you can, you can, be, you can gently approach the parents and ask them, are you related? So, once that answer is yes, you can then further explore how are you related? I think what happens in some of these cultures is it's not offensive to them when you ask them whether you're related or not. Maybe it's more offensive in the Western world to ask that you might be a first cousin. I mean, yeah. in those cultures, it's really not something that they will find offensive. And so I think it's easier to get that kind of a history in individuals from these parts of the world. And they would count that as related, in other right. words. Mm -hmm. they Let's get one more question and then we're going to keep going. Yeah. I have a question about prophylaxis. So, prophylaxis now is such a paradigm shift in the area. Mm -hmm. But it has really never been applied to women, whether with rare being disorder, with tolerance, or whatever. So, how would you design a prophylaxis for women in nutrition, pregnancy? So, Roshni, thanks for bringing that up. That's an excellent question. So, just to point out that prophylaxis is actually highly recommended for women with factor 13 deficiency because the rate of intracranial hemorrhage is as high as 30 percent in factor 13 deficiency when you have levels less than 10 percent. So, that really makes it mandatory to institute prophylaxis in order to prevent intracranial uh, hemorrhage. Also, factor 13 is important for implantation, so another area for prophylaxis is in pregnancy, especially soon after conception, because a lot of these women with severe factor 13 deficiency will have miscarriages, recurrent miscarriages, and the only way to prevent that is to provide them a prophylaxis with a replacement uh, product. Uh, as for designing a trial for the other rare bleeding disorders, I think that's really very difficult to answer, especially given the fact that some of these rare bleeding disorders do they have extremely low levels. And I'll give you an example of somebody with factor 7 deficiency, which is the most common of the rare bleeding disorders. So with factor 7 deficiency, you would think that somebody with a level of less than 1% would be. But there's a subset of these individuals who actually carry a genetic mutation which increases the risk of thrombosis. And what is the treatment that we use for factor 7 deficiency? The recombinant 7 a which by itself is known to increase risk of thrombosis. So God forbid you have a patient because a lot of times we don't have the time to get genetic diagnostics in these patients to identify, oh, are you at risk of bleeding? Are you at risk of clotting? You would automatically want to treat a bleed and somebody with severe factor 7 deficiency if they're actually bleeding. But keep in mind, you have to balance the risk with clotting. So you cannot over-treat these individuals. So that's kind of where the difficulty lies in identifying specific prophylaxis protocols. It's straightforward in the hemophilia, but rare bleeding disorder, you can bleed a clot. And somebody with factor 11 deficiency is another example, where a lot of them tend to be completely asymptomatic, and then, lo and behold, you give them a factor 11 concentrate and do something. Okay. Well, that answers your question. We have here, I think we've got time for one more question and, and okay, two more questions. And then after that, we'll close it, and then you can come up and humble the panel with even more. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
We've got one last question here. Well, I, I can, it's an excellent question, and I can sum it up with one word, logistics. Actually, two words, logistics and inventory. Uh, because whole blood has to be APO identical, uh, it, and uh, particularly because if you're not actually collecting platelets from the whole blood, it winds up losing its activity if it's been refrigerated. So you wind up with whole blood that is deficient in some of the activity. It is much easier for us to have component therapy to ensure that there's uh, availability as well as tailoring it. Of course, that has led to our various cocktails of one to one, two to one, three to two, you know, shaking not stirred and trying to resuscitate these patients and it has led to considerable confusion. Okay, so we're really closing this with identifying even more challenges. We've had a trip around the world. And uh, I would like to thank all of our speakers and especially our audience for all our wonderful questions.